Okay, so um, before we get started, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to go today through the advanced Photoshop. I'm going to show you a lot about your Assignment 102 and kind of how to make it work and a bunch of examples. I'll show you uh, professional examples. I'll show you student examples. And then we'll get into some real uh, more advanced techniques in masking. We're going to isolate some objects today. We're going to talk about how to use the clone stamp tool and do tiling textures and that sort of thing as well. So it's kind of a long-winded lecture today. I'll go, I'll go on the long side. Uh, in advanced Photoshop. So these are all our samples. And so the truth is that you can really bend reality in creepy ways. And so there's, there's certainly the creepy examples that we can throw up here. I'm going to start first with kind of the professional examples. But on every one of these, I'm going to try to talk through why it's seductive or why does it, why does it feel like it's believable. And so when we look at an image like this, it's meant to kind of freak out a little bit. And the reason that it's done this way is that the person who created this thought very carefully about what images were going to be combined together. They didn't just do a Google image search and say, hey, give me two faces and try to throw the two faces together. They set up the shot for success. So they took two pictures of the same person very close with the same lighting conditions, the same flash conditions, the same distance from the camera. All of the environmental conditions that went into making this happen were set up ahead of time. And they were very carefully controlled such that when you go to combine them together, you can make the seamless combination. Now, in this case, um, it's a bunch of creative masking about how, you know, which eye belongs to which face and which eyebrow belongs to which face. There's a couple really uh, clever areas that I think uh, this person spent a lot of time with. One is how the hair blends together in the eyebrow. That's a tricky spot because you've got hair going both directions, and you've got to figure out which hair is going to go on, on top of which one. The rest of this, like in the cheek and everything, this is pretty easy. Likewise, the shadow of the mouth really helps blend those two areas together. So it's not that hard. I mean, we did a lot of masking last class, and we talked about how you would carve off a section or, or whatever, or apply a, a, um, a, a blending mode or a, you know one of our other adjustment layers to just one section. It's the same concept, only this time we're just saying show this versus show that. And we'll talk about isolating objects today anyway. Uh, but it's not that hard as long as you set up your images for success. And that's really what a lot of the lecture today is going to be about. It's about setting up your images for success. So another one. This is actually shockingly simple to do. You probably could all do this right now today with the skills that you have. But again, it's about setting up the image. So in this case, we've got the young person looking at the old person in the mirror. So it's looking at yourself when you're older or whatever. So in order to set this up, you need two things. One, you need the old person. Number two, you need the young person, obviously. Or you need a really good makeup artist, one or the other. And so it really comes down to taking two pictures. So the first picture you take with the old man looking into the mirror at himself. And you set up the camera, same position, same angle, everything else, ideally on a tripod, and you take that picture. Then you take the second picture of the young man looking into the mirror. Now, there's a little bit of acting involved because the, the head position and stuff has to match so that the reflection would match. So you have to make sure that their heads are in the right position, etc. But essentially, you're taking those two pictures, and then your mask for this is really just, and I'm going to switch colors here. Let me do it in green. I think it'll show up a little better. Your mask is essentially just the mirror. It's a straight mask. And you're taking the image with the young person in it, and you're saying, make this section in that image transparent. And you put the image with the, the old person behind it. And you're just making that one piece cut out and look through. So it's not really that hard to bend reality in this context. So this is kind of on the simple scale of how you would set something like this up. I can't win today. I'm losing my remote control here. It's killing me. So, like I said, you can, you can end up in the creepy realm, where you get these things that are a little bit beyond uh, what you're looking for in terms of, of uh, reality, so to speak. But at the same time, this is kind of fun. But this is, again, about masking. It's a, a lot about lighting conditions. So the lighting conditions on the eyes and on the face or the mouth have to be consistent in order for those two to come together. If the light's coming from the wrong side, you're going to notice that difference. We might as well throw a few of the other creepy ones in there. 
Right. So some of these are, are, are less successful in my book because they don't have context. And you, we'll see a few of these as they go along. So this one, the background is so generic. The, the, it would, this would feel a lot more interesting if there was some background and suddenly you're, you're looking in the background and suddenly you see this plant. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, that's weird. In this context, we're focused solely on the plant. Uh, the way that it sits on the ground, the shadow is just really poorly done. And so I don't like that. But how the hands come together is kind of fun. And they did a good job with that side of things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those examples that's it's good, but it's not necessarily the, the best example. Okay, so another one. So this one, I actually, even though it doesn't have the background context that I would like to have, I think it's so nicely done. It's so carefully uh, addressed that it really, it really starts to work out nicely. So in this context, I think the key is recognizing that your knuckles on your toes, and I don't know how, many time, how, how much time you spend looking at your toes, but if you look at your toes, your knuckles have that little bit of crinkle to it, kind of the way that shoe leather has that little crinkle to it, and recognizing there's a similarity between those two that you can really take advantage of. So if you line up the, that little crinkle, it makes the transition fairly seamless from the leather into the toes. This involved a little bit of clone stamping and a little bit of masking. So it's kind of a combination of both to really get them to come together because we need some of the leather texture to kind of apply in the knuckle area. So there's, there's some crossover. So this isn't just straight masking, it's a little bit of clone stamp. We're going to talk extensively today during the demo about clone stamping and about masking. So you get that both as we go forward. So another background here. Um, this one does have some background context, which I appreciate. It's a little bit um, fake in a way. You know, it just feels a little fake. The shadows aren't quite right. But, you know, it certainly is, is a successful take. This one is extremely difficult to do well. And I've had some students who have tried to do something on this theme. And it's just so hard to get the angle of everything correct um, and to get the, the lighting correct in something like this uh, to make it stand out. And it's, it's the subtlety of this is part of what makes it really look good. And it's, it's almost painterly. The face is almost flattened out in how it looks. It's not quite as three-dimensional anymore. So the, the control with which the shadows were applied is part of what makes this work. Uh, the way that the, the seam on the leaf lines up dead center on the nose really helps kind of break that apart. Uh, and the way it transitions into the leaf itself is, is really carefully done. But I like to show this as kind of the ultimate example of how you would put stuff uh, together. So this one uh, is a little bit of a different take. We're using depth of field here to our advantage, so we're blurring out the background focusing on the foreground with that little puzzle piece. If the background was clear and sharp, it would be a lot less realistic or a lot less believable because we'd see that there's this like black thing that just kind of is the shape of the puzzle piece. But because it's blurred out, our brains interpret, oh, there's a cavity there where this puzzle is supposed to go. So you're leaving a lot to your brain to interpret. So don't forget to use strategies like that to make the person who's looking at it's brain fill in the details rather than you have to get it perfect. There's no three-dimensionality to that uh, behind. So it's kind of an interesting take on it. Oops. Sometimes layering can make a, a good impact where, you know, in, in, in this context, there's a drawing that's interacting with the photograph or the photograph of the hand holding the photograph. So there's, there's layers involved in terms of how you would set it up. And it takes some work to, to set something like this up and have it feel like they all kind of match up and blend together in a reasonable way. But don't forget about the idea of reaching into a particular scene from the outside. And you can get, you can get benefits out of that. I'll show you some more later on. Sometimes it's about what do you see? You know, you walk into the grocery store and you see the thing of carrots, and suddenly you're like, well, what if one of those had an eye looking out at you? And so you, you blend reality that way. And so you're, you're trying to identify something. Now, if I had this one, this was actually one of mine from way back when I was in uh, undergrad. So it's like ancient history. I think it was like Photoshop 6 or something. Um, if I had to do over again, I would have been far more careful about the composition. right? This ends up way over on one side. It should have been more of a rule of thirds. Like, I would love to have, have a do over on that. But like I said, it was you know, like ancient history. Oops. Love this one. Totally love this one. Uh, 
<laughs> because it just, it's fun. It's fun and it's playful. There's some difficulty in setting this one up to really get it to, to work. The areas to pay attention to are right here and how the hand grips the toilet right in there. I'm gonna undo my line so you can see it. How the shadow is cast from the hand down on the toilet. There's a lot of careful detail that goes into this. Now recognize you're not gonna be inside the toilet to do this. So you have to figure out how you can, how, how can you match up so that your hand is the right width, it's gripping the right way so that it feels realistic. I think that's one of the things that, that breaks down when you're trying to blend scenes where you can't actually be in the toilet doing it because you have to make your hand match and the lighting conditions match when you take that particular photograph to make it feel realistic. And in this case, I think they do a particularly good job of making that uh, dimension match. Oh, I lost it again. This one's blending the, the, the eye with the kind of the cracked texture of earth. Um, I think one of the things that I like about this one is the combination of the black and white and the color. So the ground and the soil is in black and white, uh, and that's distinctly different from uh, the color of the eyeball. And so you kind of get that uh, juxtaposition, which I think makes this work nicely. So these ones get to be playful. And you've already seen one. I showed you an example of this uh, when I gave you your handout uh, for your assignment. It's the idea where you take something away. Uh, and I think they end up being rather successful. So in setting this particular shot up, it's, again, two photographs. You've got one photograph of you, you know, with your toes. This one's not me. <laughs> it's not my toes. Um, with your pants down, and you take that picture. Then you carefully step out of your pants, right? And you take the picture again, looking at just your pants without the toes and without you inside. But again, you were very careful. Lighting conditions are the same. Angle of the camera is the same when you take these particular shots. And you're very careful when you get yourself out of the pants. And then it's just a matter of masking such that the picture without you in it is what is inside of those pants. And everything outside is the picture with you and your feet. So you're just being very careful about which parts are being shown in which particular image. This one's a professional artist that does this kind of stuff. Um, much harder to do, uh, but it's kind of fun and, and, and it, gets, it gets a little bit playful, but I'm not gonna even pretend that I could explain how to do that one. Uh, this one, I like it because of how carefully they thought about lighting uh, and they tried to blend these scenes together. So it's really, there's a lot about lighting and, and what's being lit and how it's being lit and the spotlight, et cetera, particularly in the shadow behind the person. Uh, the fact that the shadow curves along the surface of the coffee cup, those things really matter and they start to make you believe that it could be happening. Um, so dealing with the shadow here, if that's something you could fake. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, next class, about how you can, can create the shadow and then adapt it for a particular scene. So you can fake the shadow pretty well uh, on something like this. Uh, I think one of the areas where it breaks down a little bit, though, is we see the shadow really strong up here. See if it'll let me back in so I can draw on this again. I forgot to turn off Wi-Fi. That's what I have to do in order for this to work. It's supposed to be Bluetooth. Um, but anyway, so in this particular scenario, the shadow is working nicely up here, but the shadow is completely gone down here. And so for this to be really, truly realistic, we need a little bit more of the shadow somehow dealing with her feet and her legs because those, that shadow would exist somewhere. So the places where this tends to break down or the realism breaks down, is where the light doesn't match up because your eyes pick up on that. You couldn't necessarily intuitively tell me, oh, there's something wrong. But if you were looking at this, uh, let me just clear that out. If you were looking at this for a second, you'd say, well, there's the, you know, some of it's really good, but there's something wrong. And if I started to block things off and you looked at just down here, that's where your eye would say, yeah, that's just something's not quite right. She's not grounded. She doesn't feel like she's standing. Uh, and so those are the things to try to pay attention to. That's just silly. There's no way to describe that other than it's silly. Um, so th this is just like the, the, the mirror one that I showed in the very beginning. The only difference is the mirror isn't um, uh, stationary. And obviously, you're not going to go have, take a picture of a lion. So you know, remember, you have to use your own pictures in this. So you can't really set this one up. 
Uh, sometimes it's bending reality in terms of you know, gravity or, or these kinds of things. It's the same, same general concept, right? You're essentially setting yourself up on a ladder or a stool or something, taking one photo, and then you're taking another photo, replacing that with the boy that's holding you up and trying to mimic the two together. A uh, couple key things on this particular setup would be to make whatever you're resting on match up so that the size matches, your shirt matches. So you're just thinking carefully about those kinds of things. So obviously the boy's not holding you up, but if you're balancing on something that's about the same size as his hand, it's gonna make the effect look a little bit more realistic. I've seen these done with, with you know, this is like high-speed photography uh, coupled with these modeling. Um, they, I've seen it done with smoke, I've seen it done with liquids. Um, they're kind of fun play on, on all of this. My guess is you don't have access to high-speed photography equipment, so it's kind of a moot point, but it's neat to look at nonetheless. Another kind of silly example, um, but you could set this up relatively easy. Um, it's just, it's about uh, finding the right thing for the baby to sit in and get the angle right, making sure that the lighting's set up the same when you take those two pictures. I don't personally have access to little mice and stuff to take these kinds of pictures, but this one's oddly intriguing for some reason. This is an example, though, where there's no background. There's no context for this, but it still feels kind of real and it's kind of interesting. You don't notice the background so much uh, because there's so much context and so much interest in the photograph itself. A changing of scales, seeing how things combine together. Um, you can actually, if you, if you do Google searches for combining images in Photoshop, you can find some tutorials on how to set this kind of a scene up. Uh, but again, just remember, you have to take all the pictures. That's the key uh, to your assignment. That one's just kind of a fun one, too, thinking about what breaks and what doesn't break. And it really, it, it sometimes is just about seeing things. You know, I wouldn't necessarily see this as I was looking at a set of power lines, but somebody saw it and made that combination, and it's kind of an interesting setup. Again, a fun one, you know, where you're, you're ironing yourself. But again, it's all about setting up the, the particular scenes. I'll show you a few more examples about how these set up. This one has to do with perspective, where it's, it's shot high and low in a particular room, and you're combining the ceiling and the floor together. So you would have to have a room that could do this kind of a setup, but it's, a, it's kind of a unique way of looking at a particular image. You know, this one, the, the sheet cascades into the snow scene. This one took a lot of work to set up, to get it to, to work and to feel right, but I think it's a really beautifully done image. Um, taken in, in combination uh, in a particular scene in two different environmental conditions. You know, one is in the storm, one is outside of the storm, and then combining the two together with the ladder and the person with the roll of paper kind of taping them up. And so it's just, it's a really professionally done version, uh, but it's really nicely done. You know, yeah, some of these you've seen before, certainly. I like this one a lot. I think it's, uh, there's something about the movement of it. Uh, and the transition of the tarp into the road is just kind of really nicely done. I don't know, that one's just kind of silly. This is another shift in perspective that's kind of fun. So you're setting yourself up for something like this, and it's really it's just a set of pictures where you're bending the picture and transitioning it. But at the same time, part of the reason, it's not just the road doing this, it's the fact that they've set up the person who's looking over the edge. And that's part of what sells this as an interesting composition, as an interesting uh, photograph. It's just kind of fun. So I'm flipping through some of these. Okay, so those were all quote professional examples. Those are ones that you can find online. I mean, if you do, if you do a Google search for Photoshop combining images, you're going to find all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's really, it's pretty easy to get inspired. All of the rest of them going forward are all examples that students have done in this class. Now remember that uh, prior to maybe three or four years ago, I didn't have the restriction where you had to use your own images. So some of these were adaptations of other people's images, and I've since put that on. Some of them, like this one, was this was in fact just the student's work um, in, in images. But it's kind of seeing 
something in something else. You know, so you look at the clouds and what do you see? Same kind of thing here where you're looking at the rocks and, and what do you see? Oops. Uh, Arash did this. This was a long time ago. This was probably 2008. He does not have all those, ta those tattoos. The whole purpose of this was to um, add all of the tattoos and everything to himself. This one is just creepy, but it's really well done. Creepy, but well done. Uh, but again, combining images, obviously he didn't take all the images when he did that. That was, that was a long time ago. This one was a while ago too, um, but I think this is probably one of the best ones I've ever seen um, in terms of combining images. The cat, he did take both of these images, um, and I think part of what makes this a really strong, compelling image is the composition of it. There's the right head tilt to it. It's the rule of thirds. Like it's, it's just very, very well set up. The extra little bit about the hand in there, there's, just, there's some subtlety that makes it a really nice, nice image. So this one is not by any means an attractive image. Like it's just not. The, uh, the quality of the image is not there. However, how the images were combined was exceptionally well done. And I like this as an illustration that sometimes it's not necessarily about having the best image, it's about how they combine together. So this is two images, one, they're both shot you know, head on with a flash. Like they're not necessarily attractive, they're kind of at night, but the lighting conditions were the same, which caused these two to be able to combine together in a very realistic way. Like you almost can't tell that the dog is really a pig and how they combine together. Like it's, it's borderline. This one ended up being far more artistic in terms of composition, but you can certainly push that, that envelope as well. Uh, the dancer into the dress of a flower. This was one of the examples where I was talking about coming in from outside of the frame uh, and drawing. I think this one's also nicely done in terms of what's colored and what's not and thinking about which parts should be colored and which parts shouldn't be. You guys have all seen this one before uh, but I think it's a good example of kind of the, the stuff that we're doing. This one is a really good one, and I think it's a, it's a great one to try to illustrate what's happening. Uh, so again, it's two photos. The first photo, she's sitting, it's, it's taken right here. It's taken, and she's sitting on one of those little stools, right, that you guys have in the drafting lab. There you go, I put the little stool in place. Okay, so she's sitting on that little stool and she takes the picture. And so she has the picture of her, she has the picture of the stool, and in the background on the shadow, the stool is here and there would be a shadow with the stool right there. And those shadow lines would connect or whatever, right? You get the idea of how that would be set up. Then you take a picture of just, you know, cameras in exactly the same place of nothing, of, you know, no person, no stool, nothing. It's just the pure background. And so then when it comes in and it's time to do the masking, it's really about coming in and masking off all of that stool and all of that shadow so that you end up with just her. So you're seeing through where the stool was, you're seeing through to the image that was taken without anything there. Uh, and part of what makes this so realistic is it matches up with the, where the shadow was too. So she's controlling the shadow and she's controlling what you're seeing. Uh, and it ends up being a really successful one. Same, same general vein, you get, get where this is. So it's two pictures, one's the clothes without him laying there, the other one's with him laying there, and then you're combining the two together. Same, same general concept. You know, one picture with the hand in front, and the second one is without the hand, and you're combining through the hand. This one ended up being a little bit more uh, in the artistic vein. Um, I think it's kind of an interesting combination of images. Um, some of the stuff that he did really well, uh, if you look carefully here at the, the bowstring shadows and how they play across the back, that's part of what sells this as a realistic combination. Um, there's other places where the shadow really starts to break down uh, that I don't think are quite done. So this one, like there's moments of brilliance and there's moments that just aren't quite at the right level, um, which makes it a little bit harder. This is one with the, in the smoke, adding the little people in. You can see them up at the very top. Uh, hard one to set up and, and to do. This one's almost impossible to see. You have to see, you have to look very carefully, but there's a face in there. Uh, and how the two are combined together, I think that's part of what makes this really tasteful, is she thought very carefully about uh, what the face was going to be and how it would appear in the bark. 
to where it's almost, you can't see it, uh, which makes it kind of a fun little nugget to look for. Uh, you guys have probably seen these ones online, where it's the profile and the, the front view uh, taken next to each other, and then you're combining those two pieces together into one particular image. The half drawing, half photograph image, that's kind of an interesting play on it too. This was in the vein where Walking Dead was really popular. So, All right, so I'm going to stop with the sample images. Hopefully that gets your brain thinking a little bit. We're going to move over. So uh, I didn't talk too long in the lecture format, but we're going to spend a lot of time during the demo piece. OK, so on we go with exercise 107. Um, the key part about this is we're going to work to isolate and extract images from uh, backgrounds. And I asked you way back in exercise, um, I think it was 103. I think my number's wrong. Um, in exercise 103, to, when you went out and photographed the campus, I asked you to go ahead and photograph pictures of people. You can use those people. Um, alternatively, if you're unhappy with your images, you can do a Creative Commons search for images. Um, or there's actually a web, website called Unsplash. Thanks to Nick for, for pointing that out. That actually has some fantastic images on it, and I'm going to use that today. Um, the key here is that when we pick our images, we want high resolution, high quality images that we're going to work with. If you pick too low of a quality, I've seen this happen many times. Um, people do a Google image search. They don't find images that are, that are licensed for reuse. And furthermore, the image size is so small that when they go to cut it out, they get pixelated, choppy images. We want high quality images to work with. Uh, if you photograph your own, obviously, they should be high quality. If not, we want to find some high quality images to work with as well. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to find some online in just a second and show you those. When we're looking for people, we want to make sure that we include the whole person. So images where we have parts of people, let's see if I can find one like this, where they're cut off, yeah, like this, of the shoes. Yeah, that's a great image of the shoes and the person walking. Is this ever going to be useful when we collage into a scene? No. If you have the whole person, you can always cut off the person or have them walk out of the scene um, if you want to. But starting with, with somebody that's, that's cut off at the waist really limits your ability to use that down the road in Photoshop. So part of my strategy today is that you're building up a library of collage images. There are actually collage images available on the course website. If you go to the Resources tab and then you go to the Collage Images tab, there are a bunch of uh, images uh, and objects that people have already cut out for you. So here in the people, you can see that there's categories of people. There's male and there's female. They're organized by uh, views. So the more times something is viewed, the higher up it goes in the category here. So there's a bunch of uh, examples here. And so on any one of these, you can actually click and download these for your own use. Uh, and that's part of it. It was, it was creating a library so that it's really easy to collage in people and objects after the fact. Um, of course, the website's running a little bit slow for me here. But yeah, so there's a, there's a person running that's been cut out. There's a black and white version of that person. And there's supposed to be a colored silhouette of that version uh, of that as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to create all of those today. But to start doing it, we need some background um, images. So two things, two ways of going about finding images. If you have your own, that's great. If you don't, uh, I like to start with the search.creativecommons.org, which is essentially a way of searching for media that is licensed for you to reuse. So people have said, yes, go ahead and reuse it. They don't, they're not in, enforcing copyright on it. What they ask when you use it is that you create a link to their original content. So you're acknowledging that you're using it, and you create a link uh, to that content. So here in the Creative Commons search, I might say people walking or people running, something like that. And then I would choose which search engine I want to use. Flickr can be good, can have good results, though I'm finding as Verizon kind of transitioned it and, and kills it slowly in a slow death, that it might not be as good as just the basic Google image search. The difference between using Creative Commons search and then clicking on Google images is important. Because when I click on Google images and it starts to do the search, you see right up here under my tools, labeled for reuse with 
modification. That's, that's how I know that it's OK for me to be using this. If I just went to Google image search, unless I specified that, the images that I picked could very well be copywritten images, in which case, theoretically, I've only had it once happen once in my 10 years of teaching or 11 years of teaching, uh, had somebody say, wait a minute, that's my image. Can you please take it down? And usually people are nice and they don't sue you for damages or anything. They just ask that you take it down. But it's always a better practice to get in the habit of just finding images that are licensed for reuse. The cool thing about um, the web now is that there's so many images that it's really easy to find ones that are licensed for reuse without without much of a problem. Uh, so that's the, the Google image search. There's, uh, with the creative license to reuse, you can go through and you can find images in here. One of the challenges when you're doing this is always finding the right image. And it takes time. So something like this isn't the best image because the image quality isn't high enough and the people's feet are cut off. So I wouldn't pick that, not that I would pick this image anyway, but I wouldn't pick that because it's just not as good of a quality image. This image here is not too bad, uh, but it's only 2,000 by uh, 1428. Kind of borderline on quality. The person's in the foreground, so it might end up being OK. The other option is to do the Unsplash website, which I had open right here. It's unsplash.com, photos for everyone. Uh, and I put in here walking. You could choose running, for example. Uh, and one of the advantages here is the image quality is always very, very high. Uh, and so as you would be looking through this, you'd be finding an image that looks good, maybe this one. And we can look at it here. And here's the download free link. There we go. Um, in, in this particular website, it says crediting isn't required but appreciated. So if you can still set um, a link back, I think it's a really good habit to to get into. So I've already, I've already found a bunch of images. This one's a pretty good one. That was in the, the Google image search. There's the one that I worked on earlier. Uh, I think these two are pretty good as well. And again, I'm always looking for high quality image. So let me go ahead and save this image. And we'll save it there. And I'm picking images with challenging hair because I want you to see how to deal with cutting out the hair. So this one wasn't the best, but I'm going to go ahead and download this one as well. There it is. Let me show it and then copy it into my folder for today. So I've created a little bit of a collection of images to play around with to show you um, which ones will work the best. So hang on for a second while I copy this over. And there we go. So the first step then is opening these up in Photoshop. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Photoshop. I'll double click on Photoshop. I happen to already have it open. But if you didn't have it open, you would double click to open up Photoshop. And then we need to go ahead and open up the image itself. So I'm going to go to the File menu and select Open. And I'll select the first image to work with. So there's the first image. If you're worried about the size of the image, you can always go into Image and then image size, just to take a look at how big the image is. Um, so there's 4,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels. That's a pretty good size image. I feel comfortable with that. So now that I know I have a pretty good size image, I want to cut these people out of the background. And obviously, they're going to be running as a couple. They're not a single person. So it's going to take a little bit more work to cut them out. But I think it's a pretty good image to, to do the cutout with. So the first thing I'll do is, obviously, the stuff that's happening over here in the composition doesn't matter. So this is one place where composition isn't important. So I don't care that this was a nice rule of thirds composition. We're going to get rid of that by using the crop tool. So I'm going to come over here on the left side. It's kind of two overlapping uh, angles. And I'm going to crop this image down so that I'm including just the people themselves and not the background. So maybe about like that. When I'm done, I'll commit to it by clicking the checkbox at the top ribbon here. And that leaves me with just these two people. I'll press Control and then 0 to zoom in so that I'm seeing just them. Now it's time to actually start to cut these people out. And in um, Photoshop, er, earlier versions of Photoshop, CS6 and earlier, uh, we used something called the Refine Edge tool. In uh, Creative Cloud, starting in 2015, I think, um, they started adapting 
the uh, Refine Edge tool to be a little bit higher processing power to do a little bit better job. So we're going to, instead of using Refine Edge, which is what the handout says, we're actually going to go up to the Select menu, and we're going to choose Select and Mask, which is essentially the new version of Refine Edge. So it's Select, and then Select and Mask. And with the Select and Mask tool, we're going to look over here at the Properties selection here. And the first thing is View Mode. So under View Mode, if I click on that, I have several different modes that are available to me. I have something called Onion Skin, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then I have Marching Ants, Overlay, On Black, On White, Black and White, and On Layers. We're going to cycle through these once I start cutting out this object so you can see what they help us do. We're going to leave it for right now in Onion Skin. And then right here under Transparency, we'll leave it at about 30%. And I'll show you what that does in a little bit. The rest of the options are fine for right now. We'll come over to our toolbar on the left side. Notice it's different than our standard toolbar. And we'll start with the first option here, which is called the Quick Selection Tool. And with that Quick Selection Tool, I'm just going to start dragging and as I do it, Photoshop is going to start to find edges for me, which makes life really easy. As this happens, and as I start to select, you'll see that it will turn more solid than it was. So instead of being this checkerboard background, we're starting to see the people as they come out. Sometimes you select a little bit too much. So in here, it selected this part of the background that I don't want. If I hold down the, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see the cursor there. If I hold down the Alt key, the cursor changes from having, I'm zooming in enough so you can see this a little bit better. See the cursor there? It has a plus sign in the middle of it. If I hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, it has a minus sign in it. That means subtract from. So let me zoom back out a little bit. And I could actually subtract out by holding down the Control key, that section there, and that section there. I could subtract back out this section. Like that. A little bit more there. I've let go, and I need to get his hair back in. Goofy as that hair might be. Oh, looks like he's missing an ear, so we need his ear. We need her hair. Oh, got too much. Back to the Alt key. Let's get rid of this. Get rid of that. Need to add a little bit more right in there. Our little fingers. Subtract out right in there. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to see what we've selected and what we haven't selected. So I think this onion skin works nicely in the initial selection phase. But sometimes if we switch the view to, for example, on black, we can then change the opacity of the background to where it becomes black. So I'm, I'm changing this slider here. We were at 30 something percent. If I change it all the way up to 100 percent, we can see the background having black on it. And that helps to identify, OK, what, what things have we missed? What are we not seeing quite right? Looks like we've got a little area right in there. Oops, wrong way. Let me hold down Alt to subtract from. A little bit more in there. Perfect. A little bit of extra hair in there. We don't want that piece. We can also switch from the on black to the on white, which is the opposite, where we're seeing the, it against the white background. So it looks like maybe I missed some of the shoe. Oops. Sorry, I'm supposed to add to the selection. Paint in a little bit more. Paint in a little bit more of that shoe. Whoops, too much there. We'll go back to Alt and we'll get rid of that section again. Now, once we feel like we've gotten it fairly well resolved, something like that, we need to spend some more time with the hair. So I'm using Control Plus to zoom in. And I'm looking specifically at the hair. Now, this isn't as sharp of an image as I would like. I'm going to come back 
and deal with the sharper image in just a little bit. But once we've gotten to this point, we're going to switch our tools from the quick selection tool to the next one down, which is the refine edge brush tool. And what we'll do with the refine edge brush tool is we're going to go right along the edge of the hair and it's going to start to determine what parts of the hair are see-through to the background. And so we'll work through because in all reality some of the hair we're going to be able to see through along the edges here. So we need to work through the edges of the hair so we can start to see through it. Now, unfortunately, my image quality isn't quite as good as I would like because I'm not getting as good of results, but when I zoom out, it looks a little bit better. I'll do his hair as well, so let me zoom in, control plus, space bar to pan, we'll come up here and we'll do the edge of his hair. like that, and what it's doing is it's isolating all the little individual pieces of the hair rather than just kind of blurring the edges. Uh, I may need to work on some of the coat edge as well, depending on, on where it is. We can also go back to the quick selection tool if I feel like I've done too much. We can zoom in and we can sharpen up that edge just a little bit more. Now, all of this, even if I don't like the final result, so that did a pretty good job, uh, can be adjusted after the fact using the masks, which we're going to come back to. So once I've isolated these people, and I'm going to do this again so that there'll be a repeat process, if I were doing this for me, I would spend just a little bit more time with that refine edge and really get um, it set up correctly. But when I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and select the OK. And when I select the OK, notice that it takes my original image and applies a mask to it to cut these two people out. And we're seeing the checkerboard pattern behind. Now if we made a mistake, so if I look down here at his feet, there's a lot of extra baggage around his feet. I can come back to my mask tool. I can use my paintbrush just like we did last class with black and I can paint in to get rid of that extra little bit. So you can always fine tune your result by using the mask tools after the fact. Now remember I went a little too far there so I can flip into white and I can paint back that part of the shoe, flip back to black and we can refine that out just a little bit more. A lot of cutting these people out is understanding what's happening in the background and the foreground. Oops. And if the background is a different color, it makes cutting things out just a little bit easier. In this case, the background was a little too close to the foreground, which made it a little challenging. So I might spend a little bit more time refining that just a little bit. I'll press Control-0, and now we can see it um, cut out. Let me do this whole thing again. I'm going to open up. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. I'm going to open up this one. This is a higher quality image. It was from that Unsplash website. And so you can see that as I zoom in, we're getting a lot of individual little hairs that are here. Uh, and you guys can see it a lot better on, on a computer screen than you will be able to on the projector. But this is going to be a much harder, challenging cutout because I want that, uh, those hairs to end up being see-through. So I'm going to do the same process, though. So I'll start first. Let me press Control-0 to see everything. I'll start first with the Crop tool. And I'll crop this down so that it includes just the woman, like that. And I'll commit to it by check, clicking the check mark here uh, up on my top ribbon. Now that I have this, I'm going to go back up to the Select menu. And I'm going to choose Select and Mask. And Select and Mask, the view mode is currently in the onion, which is good. I'll use the Quick Selection tool right here and I'll start painting in where this lady is. And because of the higher quality image, you can see that it does a very good job of isolating where the woman is versus where the background is. Let me zoom in a little bit more as I start to get closer to her face. And we'll zoom in on just her face. 
going to come down here to her feet. And we'll start to include her feet. So the feet are a little bit problematic because of the, the sand and the ripples at the bottom here. So I can use the Alt key and I can try to work my way through getting rid of some more of that. Truth is, the feet are going to be a little bit easier to deal with with a mask after the fact. Um, I, having done this enough times, I know that trying to, to isolate the quick selection um, is just more work than actually doing the mask later on because you'll keep going backwards and forwards like I'm doing right here where you can't quite get just the whole foot. That's probably about as good as I can get without using some more refined masking. So we can come up here and look at her hair. Let me zoom out just a little bit. And here's a good place where switching modes to maybe the on black, we'll start with that first. When we switch to the on black here, you can see that that is still white, which means it's not transparent. Likewise, there's a little bit in there, there's a little bit right in there. This is a good opportunity to subtract from the selection that little bit of hair, like that. Uh, it's too much, so I'm going to go into the Refine Edge tool. So here's my Refine Edge tool, and I'm going to paint right along this edge. And we should start to see all the individual hairs show up, and those white areas become black or transparent. And so it takes a little bit of time to work through all of those edges. When we're done working with the on black layer, sometimes it's useful to switch your view mode into the on white so you can see the individual hairs and the fact that they're cut out. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, you can see some of it on the, on the projector here. And so we'll keep flipping back and forth. We can go back to the onion skin if we want. We can keep working with the on black and the on white. The other option is to switch to the black and white mode here which really helps you to identify the hairs and how you're seeing those. We can zoom in just a little bit. Oops, sorry. Control plus, zoom in a little bit more. Uh, and I might change a few of the settings here. Uh, let's bump these up. Let's do a feather of 0.3. And let's do a smoothing of 3. Let's see if that helps us a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, the smoothing might be a little bit too much. I might go back to one. Yeah, there you go. And I'm really trying to identify all those individual little hair strands. And hopefully on the projector you guys can see. Yeah, you can start to see all those individual hair strands showing up. So I work my way down her hair. And there is a good example right there where I was able to get those little hairs that were, what were flowing off. Keep working along here. It does take some time. It does take some patience. But your end results are going to be far superior if you take the time to isolate this hair. All right, I think I've gotten the hair there. Let's work on the top of the head. So I adjusted these, uh, the smoothing to 1 and the feather to 0.3. Uh, if you're feeling like that's too much, you can, you can change those adjustments down as well. Again, it's dependent on the object that you're isolating. And so in this scenario, working with the black on white has really helped me identify the hair. I might switch back to the on black. I might switch back to the onion skin, depending on how I'm uh, working through this. Um, let me go to the on white for a second. So I can check her, her face. I'm going to work my way around. Yep, her coat looks pretty good. I'll come down here. We have issues along this edge. Like I said, I think the easiest thing for me to do is to do it after in the masking. Uh, because of the sharp edges of the feet, I think I'll have a better time of doing it. Let me work my way back up.
Yeah, looks pretty good. And I've got all that hair nicely isolated. Perfect. So now that I'm done and I've worked my way around the objects, I'll go ahead and say OK. And that then cuts her out. Let me press Control-0 so you can see it. She has the background, but I have to go in and I have to fix the feet. So I'm going to work on the mask itself. I'll press Control plus to zoom in so that I can see just her feet. There we go. I'm going to paint with black to make things go away. So I'll use the brush tool. I can press the B key on the keyboard, or I can just um, select the brush tool. And I'm going to paint out all of this ocean that I don't want to have. Now, as you can probably tell, I've got a little bit of a challenge here because her foot is sunk into the sand just a little bit. So I can choose to leave a little bit of a shadow at the bottom, or I can make the shadow go away and try to leave her with a little bit less of a foot. Um, both are a little bit problematic when we go to do the collage work later on, uh, whether we really want her to have the shadow or whether we really want her to have less of a foot. I'm not sure what's the better strategy. But I'll work my way through. I'll touch this up. like that. Get rid of those pieces there as well. If you feel like you've got too much, if you took too much out, remember you can switch your black and your white and you can get more back. So you can smooth out that foot just a little bit more. Oh, too much off of that section. Likewise there, we'll flip. Helps if you actually flip the colors like you're supposed to. All right, so there's that. Um, and then I'll flip one more time, and I'll finish this up by getting rid of that section there. We'll work our way around that. A little bit more, bear with me. And we'll get rid of that. So at this point, I'll press Control-0. I've isolated my person. I have a transparent background, which is great. I want to save this as a color version um, to be able to use later on. So I'm going to go ahead, and before I do anything else, I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to go to Export, and I'm going to use the Save for Web. I still like that. But a couple things here. One, if I save it as a JPEG, it's going to make a white background. And I don't want that to have a white background. Instead, I'm going to choose a PNG. It doesn't really matter whether you choose the PNG 8 or the 24. I'll choose the 24. Notice that the check mark for transparency is set. That means the background is going to stay transparent. That's the way we want it. And we want our image to be full size, which it currently is, our width and our height. And I'll go ahead and click Save. So this is the woman on the beach in a coat. That was what it was saved already as. Let me put it on my flash drive into today's folder. And I'm going to append to this an underscore color. So I'll do underscore color so I know this is the colored version of it. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. So that's the color version. Now I want to create a black and white version. So the black and white version, we've already done this with photographs. I'm going to do the same thing. I'll go back up to my layer. I'll go to New Adjustment Layer. And I'm going to choose the Channel Mixer Adjustment Layer. I'll say OK. I'll check the box for monochrome so that it turns into black and white. And then I want to look through all of the presets to find the preset that makes this look the best. So I'll cycle through. And I think I like the green filter the best. Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe it's the blue filter. Yeah, the blue filter's not too bad either. OK, so once I have this in black and white, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll go to File, and then Export. And this is going to be Save for Web Legacy. I'm going to make sure it's PNG 24. I'll go ahead and click on the Save icon. And this time, it's going to be the same uh, name here, but I'm going to add underscore BW for black and white. 
and I'll go ahead and click on Save. There you go. The last piece of this is I want to create just a silhouette with a solid color. And we can create the silhouette with black, or we can create the silhouette with white, but that's a little bit problematic when we go down the road because you're stuck with either black or white. I've found that if we create a silhouette with a neutral 50% gray, or excuse me, with a 75% uh, gray, you can swing that value darker or lighter to, to work really nicely in a, in a collage afterward. We are going to use these next class, and I'll show you where they become so valuable. So I need a new layer. And so I'll go ahead and click on uh, the New Layer button. I could also go up to Layer, New Layer. Either way is just fine. And on this new layer, this layer 1, I'm going to paint using my brush tool with a 75% gray. I'm going to get to the 75% neutral gray by coming here to the CMYK values and turning everything to 0, except K, which is the equivalent of black. Uh, that black value here, I'm going to set at 75. So it's C0, M0, Y0, K75. Once I've set that, it's a nice kind of dark gray. I'll use my brush tool. I need to make that a little bit larger to make this easier. There it is. And I'm going to paint the whole thing in this gray. Like that. Uh, you could use the fill tool if you would rather. Um, I find that it to be just about as fast to just paint it over in gray. Once I have that all painted in gray, I already have the mask. I created the mask down here. So I just want to copy that mask up onto this layer. We did this last class. I'm going to do that by holding down the Alt key and dragging this mask up onto layer 1. And that then cuts it out as a silhouette for me. So I don't have to create the mask again. I've already created it once. I can just move it up by holding down the Alt key and create a copy of it on the gray. So here's the silhouette version. I'll go to File, and I'll go to um, Export. And this one's going to be Save for Web, same thing. It's still a PNG 24. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. And this time, uh, I'm going to do underscore gray, and then click Save. And so now I have the silhouette version, I have the black and white version, and I have the color version all ready and saved. You're going to do this multiple times today for practice. Again, it's about extracting the objects. The higher skill level you get at doing this, the better off you're going to be. Um, and so you're going to, I'm asking that you do it at least five times for five different people. Each time you're done, you're going to create a new post on the course website. So it's not going to be one post with all the people in it. You're going to create a new post each time. So I'm going to go through that and show you how to do that part as well. I'm going to come here. I'll go to New and then Post. Uh, and so this is, uh, I don't know, a woman. What was it called? I don't remember. There you go. Woman on the beach in a coat. Okay. And so all I need to do is I need to upload all three versions into this post. So I'm going to go to Add Media. I'm going to go to Upload Files. I'm going to select the files. And I'll go to Today's Folder. And there's my woman on the beach in a coat. I'm going to select all three, the color, the black and white, and the silhouette. And I'll say Open. We'll give it a second to finish its uploading here. Okay, once they've finished uploading, they'll all have check marks in them. So if I click Insert into Post, it's going to insert all three of those images into the body of my post. There we go. There's all three as I scroll down. I'm still going to need to 
come down here to set a featured image. So I'll click on set featured image. I'll pick the color version as the featured image. There it is. And now before I actually click post, I have to come back in and categorize and make sure that this is exercise 107. There it is. But below that, there's also a category for collage images. These are ways that people have uh, established for actually searching for people. So if you wanted to search for something specific, uh, they're categorized. It's kind of like tagging your, your uh, picture. So here, I might say this is, I don't know, walking. And I should probably say that this is come down here a little bit more. This is in the people category. It would be a female. Uh, people have, have worked through different uh, descriptions here. If what you're seeing or if what your image is isn't matching up here, you can always add a new term. You just click the Add a New Term button, and you might add something uh, down here. Once you're done, you'll go ahead and come back, and you'll click on the Publish tab like that, and that'll be the first one that I turn in. So each one is separate. And you're going to work for the whole class time to create multiples of these. Spend, take your time, because we will be using these a little bit later on. I actually noticed after I did the export on the gray version that I have some issues down here at the feet that weren't quite resolved. So I would come back and fix those so we didn't have those little halos at the feet. Uh, that would be problematic later on. So you're going to do that. That is through part one and part two. But the next thing that I'm going to do is something called a tiling texture. And a tiling texture is essentially an image that we make such that we can put lots of them together and they become a seamless image. And so we need to find some kind of a texture to work with. Um, and so I'll do a Creative Commons image search for this as well. I'll go to search.creativecommons.org. And we can do Google image. That's fine. And let's see. Let's do, um, all right, so I picked wood plank siding for lack of something better. And under size, again, I'm going to say larger than. In this case, 1024 or 768 is probably the minimum. You could do the, the 2 megapixel. And here, I'm going to look through, and I'm going to try to find an image that is reasonably um, straight. So as I look at these images, some of these work better. Like that would probably work pretty nicely. The, the, the siding is nice and straight. It's fairly consistent. Others of these would be a little bit more challenging. Like this one's slightly in perspective. This one, for example, is in perspective. These lines go, they vanish off to the right here. I'd have to make corrections for that over time. This one here is a really nice image, except that they have a warp and a bend to them. So I'd have to make a correction for that. Let me go ahead and open that in a new tab. And. Like I said, that one's good. Unfortunately, that has those two light patches on it. That, would, that makes it less desirable. I kind of like this one. OK, so there's that wood. And I have no idea what, uh, what website I went to to get this. There's my download link. Let it finish its download. This one here is also nice. OK, there's, there's that image. That's good. It's a nice high resolution image. Uh, free download original. Oh, I have to log in. We'll skip that one for now. OK, so I have this one. That's a high, high quality image. And there it is. Let me go ahead and copy it, and I'll put it on my flash drive. And I'll go ahead and paste it here. There it is. Then I want to open this in Photoshop. So I'll right click and say uh, open with. Oh, I can't do open with because it's not linked up correctly. I'm going to go back to Photoshop. I'll go to File and then Open. 
And I'm going to open this image right there. And so this image is, the, the idea here is that I want this such that, uh, let me see if I can explain it a little bit better. Uh, let me look. Sorry, you don't have to follow me do this. Just give me a second to give myself a little bit more space to work with. OK, so if I had this, this image here, sorry, give me a second. All right, so there's that image. If I had this image and I wanted to make more of that, and I wanted them to go together, if I put this image on top of it, we could tell that there's a seam there. Likewise, if I put another version of this image right here, we could kind of tell that right, there are separate images that are kind of glued together, and we're seeing this seam. I want that seam to go away. And I want to be able to do this such that we don't see the seam at all. So I'm going to back up here to where I just opened up the single image. There it is. First thing I need to do is I need to make some corrections. So like I said, this image has some skew to it. These lines are a bit bowed. I'll go to my Edit menu, and I'll go to Transform, and I'm going to use the Skew command here. And when I do the Skew command, I can adjust each side. to get them so that they're more straight. If that's not working well enough, right? I may need to, to exaggerate this a little bit more. If that's not working, you could use one of the other ones. Let me cancel that one for a second. Again, under Edit and then Transform. Uh, and instead of Skew, I could go into, I think Warp will probably do it. This gives me finer control. I'm going to move these points up. I'll move that one up too. I'll move this down. I'll move that one down. And this first round, I did it visually. But I can also go to the View menu and turn on my rulers, and then bring down a guide so that I can see if those are, in fact, straight. So that one's straight. This one down here. This one needs to go a little bit further down, like that. OK, so these are all nice and straight. So I made that adjustment. If you're struggling to make that adjustment, just pick a different image that doesn't need the adjustment. In my case, I needed the adjustment because the image had the warp uh, to begin with. So I'll go ahead and commit to that. Let me hide those guides so that you don't get confused here. We'll just clear those guides. So now I have those lines straight across. And I need them to, to be able to tile together. I've got a little bit of a clear, transparent spot on those lower corners. Let me go ahead and crop it down just a bit. So I'll make this a little bit smaller there. We'll make that a little bit smaller there. The other thing that I'm looking at is I have a line that's right here, and I have a line that's right here. Really, it would be nice if I was about halfway on one of these boards, and about halfway on, say, that board there. Come down a little bit more. There we go. So I have that about halfway on those two boards. I'll commit to it. And so I've cleaned up this texture already. This, if I were to tile it, would look OK. It's not perfect, but it would look OK. So if I were to glue it together, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So at this point, I do want it to be seamless. I want it to look really nice. We're going to use one of the filters that's available in Photoshop. If I go to Filter, and I go to, um, I think it's under Other, and then Offset. So Filter, Other, Offset. I'm going to offset both the horizontal and the vertical, which is essentially what it's going to do is it's going to take uh, and split the image and recombine them together. So I can toggle this over, and we should be able to see it. There we go. So the, this edge 
is now perfectly seamed to that edge. So if I were to copy and paste this right now, this edge here would match up perfectly with that edge. There wouldn't be any seam there. There is, however, a little bit of a seam in the center that I'm going to have to deal with. I'm going to do the same thing vertically, like that. So there's a little bit of a seam right there, and there's a little bit of a seam right there. I'll go ahead and say OK. And if I zoom in, I can see those two seams. So can you guys see that seam just a little bit and that seam just a little bit? I'm going to use a tool now to get rid of that seam called the clone stamp tool. It's available right here. It looks like a rubber stamp. And this rubber stamp tool, essentially what it does is it allows me to copy from one place and paste it in another place. So let me make this big so that I can hopefully show you this example here. So if I wanted to copy this right here, I'd hold down the Alt key on the keyboard and I'd click. And I'm just going to do a single click. Now that piece where I, where I am copying from, I can paste it somewhere else. So I can take that and I can move it over here and I can paste it over here. So it's copying one thing and putting it somewhere else. Let me make the edge uh, really sharp here. I'm trying to find something that's, that's obvious that you'll be able to see here. Uh, let me clone stamp. Let me make it a nice hard edge so that hopefully this will be clean. And make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to hold down Alt. If I were to copy this part right there, see that little white dot? Right there, you're going to see that white dot again. So there's the piece that I'm copying, and I can put it wherever I want it. I can put it right there. I can put it wherever. So what I'm going to do, I don't want it to be sharp. I want to blur the edges a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my hardness. We'll do it about 30%. I'm going to hold down the Alt key. I'm going to copy from right here. I'm going to move over to right about there. And I'm going to continue moving over like that until I seam those two together. And so that seam, other than those three little white dirt spots, it essentially it copied that seam and made the, the black line that divides these two come together. I'll do the same thing. I'll hold down Alt right here, click, let go of Alt. And as I come over here, we'll move it up ever so slightly there. And we'll transition those two together. So you see how that now blends together. The texture in the middle here still needs to be blended. So I'll hold down Alt, copy a little bit right in there. Again, I'm holding down Alt to copy from and adjusting and then doing a little click. I'll hold down Alt again. We'll go right over like that. When you're doing this, you want to pay a little attention to the wood grain, hoping that you can get things to match up nicely. Yeah, about like that. That looks pretty good. I have a horizontal seam that's happening right here. This one will just kind of seam over that just a little bit. There's a little bit of dirt right there. I could just get rid of that dirt altogether. Like that. that looks pretty good. That looks good. I need to seam these two. I'll hold down Alt. And we'll transition those two together. That was a good example of having to pay a little bit of attention to the wood grain to make sure that the wood grain goes through uh, because of the wood grain. A little bit more up here. Let me make my bracket size a little bit smaller. I'll hold down Alt. And we'll make that one go away. Now if I press Control-0 and we were to look at this, it looks as if there is no seam in the middle anymore. I've gotten rid of that seam. And the advantage here is that once I save it, let me go to File and then Save. Oh, sorry. I want to save a JPEG of it. I'll go to File, Export, Export As. This can be a PNG or a JPEG. It doesn't matter. There's no transparency to it. So it, it doesn't matter whether it's a JPEG or a PNG. There we go. I've saved it. I'll go to Export All. We'll put it in here. Uh, I'll call this Wood Plank uh, Tiling. Click Save. Now the advantage to this is if I were to show you this tiling, 
Let me make that adjustment to, so you can see it. You do not, by the way, have to confirm that it works. This is something I'm showing you in lecture format so that you can see that it does work. That. If I were to take this and copy it and paste it, when this stacks up to right there, you won't see a seam. You guys see how that looks like it's, if I were to paste this again to right there, you again wouldn't see the seam. We're getting a little bit of repetition because of that little knot that's showing up. If I were to paste this right here, it would appear to go keep going. Likewise, this, if I put it right there, would appear to keep going. This one up here would appear to keep going. It looks like there's a little gap there because I didn't, I didn't actually stick them together. So this is the advantage of a tiling texture, is that once you've made this, it's really easy to have this go on as big or as large as you want. And so I want to introduce this as a concept so that you have an understanding that this is something that you can make because in collage work frequently something like this is really useful. Okay? So I'm asking you today to focus on cutting out people. Once you've, once you've cut out a few people, I want you to try to make a tiling texture. Once you feel comfortable and made the tiling texture, go back and cut out some more people. Once you've cut out some more people, go back and make another tiling texture. Make sense? I'm suggesting that by the end of the day, you should have about five cutout people and about three tiling textures, ish. This is really important for you to learn and understand how to cut out objects and how to work with these objects because once you've done this and you have that skill, next class, we need to be able to collage in the objects together. You will use the people that you cut out today next class. So you do need to have those. 